Settle in, class, because today we're covering one of my all-time favorites, shape-shifting and spell-casting with incredible versatility. The druid is one of the most ancient and powerful of all. Whether we're helping animals grow or decay, reaching for the stars, or setting the world ablaze, you're sure to find something that appeals to your particular subclass needs. We'll start with mechanics, then move into flavor. You ready? Let's go. Okay, first things first, what are we even talking about? A druid is someone so in tune with nature that they draw divine power from it. But unlike the nature cleric, they're not just simping for the lady in the lake. They're typically focused on the concept of nature itself. That nets some two main abilities which grow over time. Now you might be thinking, Phoebe, hey, baby, you said this was one of the more complicated classes and the really versatile. Only other thing they got is agent slower and they only got a couple weapons and medium armor without metal. Even Barbarian gets more than that. Well, that's all true, but I wasn't lying. The first power they have is full spell casting and druids get the kind where their whole spell list is always open. They just choose which spells they want to have on hand for the day. So keep spells like Call Lightning and Conjure Animal on hand and if someone dies, you just swap them out for reincarnate in the morning. And if you're wondering what those spells are, it's because the druid spell list is actually pretty unique. 19 druid only spells, and 36 unique to them and the ranger. Their primary draw is wonderful battlefield control and unique area of effect options, but they've even got utility and healing. The options they have are great too, but their fantastic magic probably isn't your first thought with a druid. What most people think of is the other ability, wild shape. Twice per short rest, you can shape shift into an animal, gaining all their physical stats but keeping your own mental ones. You don't get legendary or layer actions if the creature has them, but you do have all the other tricks like tripping and trampling, and you can use any of your own abilities that the new form could reasonably do. You also get all of their HP, and when that reaches zero, you just go back to being yourself, alongside the same HP you're at when you shifted. At first, you're restricted to relatively weak things like the elk or boar, and can't fly or swim or even cast spells, so you can maintain ones you cast beforehand. As you grow, you get stronger forms like dire wolf or giant eagle, learn how to fly or swim, and can even cast magic as long as there aren't material components. And at level 20, you can just wild shape infinitely, but most druids use this as utility first and foremost. Your strength doesn't come from being a boar against a dragon, it comes from being an inconspicuous rat sneaking through the sewers, or a normal pigeon that just happens to be in the area when lightning kills someone in broad daylight, with one incredible exception, but we'll get there soon. Just know that this is the other portion adding complexity, being able to grab the form of any animal within a certain power level. I recommend finding the stats for a couple of general animals like cats or wolves and just having them on standby. They also technically have one more ability, Druidic. It's a druid-only language for their secret groups called Circles, which is confusingly also the name for their subclasses, though the druids in the same organizations aren't always the same subclass, and there's usually quite a few non-druids or even non-humanoids in the organization. From here on out, when I say circle, I mean the subclass, or the shape. Circles are your druids' focus, giving them new abilities or amplifying the ones they have at level 2, 6, 10, and 14. To go any further, we'll have to get into those powers directly, beginning with the Circle of Dreams. This is your Fey Druid. They speak for the trees and work with its keepers to break both your knees. Okay, not really. They're more healing focused and get a pool of D6s to temporarily heal people as a bonus action. It's like a temporary healing word, but with a 120 foot range and you can cast spells on the same turn, so honestly just better in a fight. That's what you get from the Summer Court of Fairies and such. But from the Unseelie Fey, you get a dome to protect and hide your campsite while you rest. Yeah, if you haven't caught on, this one's not really a fighter. At level 10, they can teleport themselves or others a few times a day, and at 14, you can finish a short rest by casting Dream, Scrying, or Teleportation Circle. This one's all about utility and healing and such, which goes pretty well with your natural spell list. If you're just looking to heal and spread good vibes, you could definitely do worse. I can't stop imagining this one just sitting in someone's pocket as a mouse, high and passing out heals and good berries. Personally, I would focus on your role as a bridge between the Fey and the mundane. Lean into the fickle and whimsical nature of your Fey friends. This is a perfect druid for a gnome or elf or fairy. Or, I can't believe I'm saying this, you don't really need the Fey. All your powers are related to healing, travel, and communication. You work great as a messenger or just a general scout. Someone who just lives so closely with the land, they're basically one with it. Though if you're wanting to be in tune with a particular land, that's the next one. Circle of Land is the one devoted to the land and spellcasting. You pick an extra cantrip, you recover some spell slots during a short rest, and you get an extra list of eight spells that are always prepared. They're based on the land you're devoted to and often not on the druid spell list, like slow or create food and water. You also just have an easier your time against a lot of creatures. Non-magical plants can't slow you down, and even magical effects like Entangle struggle to attack you. Eventually, Bay and Elementals can't charm or frighten you, and you can't be poisoned or suffer disease. And by level 14, plants and animals have to make a save to even try and attack you, and they know that in advance, which means they'll probably ignore you and just go bite the wizard instead. The Land Druid is nice and simple while still maintaining power. Passive effects and immunities with some extra pre-picked spells, it's about as simple as a Druid gets. So think about where exactly you got these powers. This one draws from a specific land, but how specific? Could it be one mountain or hill? Does it have to be the actual dirt, or could the concept of the penguins living on it be their power source? Is your power even from this world? You could be an elemental cultist. And I know I was poking fun at the cleric
cleric, but there's nothing stopping you from drawing power from the divine realm of a nature god, or even a god themselves. It's mostly down to your relationship. You're not an acolyte, you're a co-worker. A cleric might wake up and worship their god, thanking them for continued favor. The druid might acknowledge them through tradition and such, but it's more of a nod and good morning as you pass by a shift lead. Of course my tools are there when I clock in. They better be if the boss wants the job done competently. Otherwise, I'm just going somewhere else. They need me, not the other way around. I love the idea of just a down-to-earth backwoods tradesman sort of druid, doing honest work for remote communities. Now let's go from the most basic to the most complicated, the ones you've heard tales of, the literal elephant in the room, the moon druid. It laser focuses on one thing, wild shape. Your wild shape goes off the monster manual's challenge rating system, a loose guide to the strength of a monster. Other druids start at a max strength of one quarter and eventually get to CR1. CR1 is where you start, and end at CR6 with creatures like the mammoth. You also shift as a bonus action, so you can easily change during the fight. Multiple giant health bars, healing yourself by expending spell slots, and every ability in the animal kingdom, you don't really leave melee once you go in. Before long, your tax count is magic appears through resistances, and it doesn't stop at animals. At level 10, you can turn into basic elementals for two uses of wild shape, and at level 14, your shifting goes subtle, letting you use alter self infinitely. So even when you're out of wild shape, you're still getting gills and claws and horns and turning into other people. This thematically incredible ability is great for saving you spell slots and utility wild shapes. Most classes would love to have this, but the moon is so incredibly strong that people get disappointed by it. The moon druid doesn't add new abilities so much as crack open the one you already have and turn it into a behemoth, but it's also one of the most complicated due to how many full-on forms you now have access to. Other druids can just grab a few at the start and be mostly done, and with it being utility, they can mostly just improv it. You, however, will be waiting into combat with it whenever possible. You'll be updating that list seven times on your own, and add those elementals at level 10. Overall, you get 20 to 60 extra forms, depending on which books your DM lets you pull from, and all of those abilities are on top of your spell casting, which is just as strong as a normal pull caster. I'm going on about this because people forget they have a great spell list then think they're lagging behind. If your old forms aren't hitting as hard as you need and you don't get new ones until next level, just use your spells. Cone of Cold still hits just as hard, and you still have all that HP and utility when you need it. It's a lot to keep up with. I don't blame people for getting overwhelmed. So when used to its full potential, the Lunar Druid fully eclipses its competition. At least you don't have to think too much about what you want to be, because it's really hard to reflavor this druid. For something that's constantly changing its form, it really knows what it wants to be. So I recommend you look at why you're shapeshifting. A zookeeper might want to understand the needs of her animals better, or a conservationist might be living among them, a warden that can terrify poachers, knowing that every animal might just get mad when you shoot it and reverse gravity. Or maybe you're a warforged reassembling yourself into whatever form is best suited for the situation. Or a demigod, and instead of Zeus's strength or lightning, you got his penchant for turning into animals and clouds. Put that bard stereotype to shame by summoning every furry in town. Quicker than I keep summoning new subscribers. Hit that like button and tell me your favorite animal name, or favorite name for an animal, like Princess Monster Truck, or Jorts, or Snurt. And speaking of animals and summoning, we got the Shepherd Druid. They're focused on animals and fae, though mainly just the little fae that can't protect themselves. They can speak the fae's language, and can even hold full conversations with animals. They're focused on protection, summoning totems to do things like give temporary HP, heal everyone around you when you cast healing spells, or give someone's attack roll advantage. By level 10, it also automatically heals summoned animals and fae in its radius. And you're gonna wanna have summons. That's the main deal with this circle. At level 6, your summons get extra HP and count as magic for piercing defenses, and at level 14, they appear on their own if you're incapacitated. Conjure animals at max level for free if you're unwillingly knocked out. And you get to choose the animal. Pretty useful. And if all this sounds a little basic, especially after the moon druid's madness, there's a reason. Summoning was already very strong on its own, and shepherds shoring up their weaknesses keeps them around and useful far longer than you'd expect. Nobody's prepared for a sudden stampede of 32 walruses. Just make sure you're the exception or you're gonna kill the pace of combat. Now when it comes to flavor, here's the issue. Thematically speaking, the shepherd and moon druid are twins, often looking the same even when doing different things. Most things I have, like zookeeper or warden, work just as well for both. If you picked shepherd, you probably either like the moon druid but don't want melee, or you just want to be the best summoner and are fine if that means you're a druid. I'm sure you're tempted to be raised by wolves or whatever and make everything themed around one animal, but unless your DM's cool with you just saying everything you summon is a weird looking crab, good luck, because your summons are so buried and you'll keep upgrading to better versions. Especially since druids get some nearly unique summons. You can still do some original concepts with them of course, but you have to dig and often need to work with your DM for approval. A monster trainer sort of character works great here, or a classic fairy tale princess gone hostile, maybe flavored as a toy maker summoning wooden or plush animals, or a hunter reviving the spirits of the creatures he's killed to fight for him. Although my favorite is the incredibly drunk actual shepherd gone rogue. They think everything they conjure is a weird looking sheep, but it is very much a normal bear, or velociraptor, or hag. I would suggest making some sort of messed up chef that summons animals to kill and eat, but summons aren't actually killed. They're just sent back to wherever they came from, because dead animals, or 
dead mouse things, is the realm of the spore druid. Spore druids are fungus based, all about decay. They get an aura of spores that can hurt someone within 10 feet as a reaction, damage increasing as you level. They can also use a wild shape charge to flood that aura with magic, doubling the damage it deals and giving them necrotic damage with melee attacks for 10 minutes. Also heals you for 4 HP per druid level. What makes it weird is that their list of always prepared bonus spells has anime dead on it. The flavor text says that they see undeath as just different life, as long as they aren't trying to kill all life or extend their life unnaturally. I really struggle to think of an undead that isn't trying to kill all life it sees or extend their life. Even ones like the Revenant are trying to extend their life until their task is done, so I guess they're just okay with undead tools that disappear quickly. Like their level 6 ability, which converts small and medium sized beasts and humanoids that die within 10 feet into 1 HP zombies for an hour. Fungal zombies, which means these aren't proper zombies. These are cordyceps hijacking the nervous system, like what happens in nature on all sorts of creatures. So they like undeath as long as they aren't on the list of reasons that cover all undead or they're not really undead. But they have a will of the wells friend I'm sure. Anyway, <laughs> whenever your spores are in that wild shape overdrive, you can throw your aura onto a 10 foot cube and set it to attack everything. And at level 14, your own spores have changed you. You're immune to being deafened, blinded, frightened, or poisoned. And as long as you're not incapacitated, you can't be critically hit. Don't mistake my ridicule of Watsy's weird wording as complaint about the class itself. I honestly adore the theming on this. A weird bog druid that remembers decomposers are incredibly important to all night. The spores are both thematically perfect and mechanically powerful. And I gotta love how they made the wild shape into something new. Now personally, I would just play this one straight, but if you don't want to, I would ditch the mushroom entirely. Go full on Grim Reaper, the spore cloud becoming a straight up aura of a knife. Weak minions hobbling up on their own from the raw amount of negative energy coming off of you. That same energy that rips the life out of everything around you. And speaking of energy, you could go full fallout on this. Replace that mushroom with a mushroom cloud. Your necrotic aura is nuclear fallout, bringing people back as radioactive barrel ghouls. Speaking of nuclear power, we have the star domain. Though we aren't bringing down solar fire on those who squish ladybugs. We're turning into constellations. Okay, I can accept that. Your new wild shape turns you into a cloud of night sky, with your choice of constellation to adorn yourself with. The archer constellation gets a spell attack with radiant damage, the dragon stops you from rolling under 10 on your concentration checks, and the chalice gives you a bonus heal on yourself or others whenever you cast healing magic. At level 10, these become stronger, increasing the damage and the healing. Also, the dragon can fly and you can switch your forms at the beginning of every round. There's that versatility I know and love. At level 14, you get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage while transformed. And that didn't specify non-magical. Wow. Of course, you don't have to wait for high levels for the good stuff. At low levels, you get your star chart. Could be an actual map or one of those clear balls with the dots on them that project the stars in your bedroom, or even binoculars with little slideshows on them. As long as that's your spell focus, you get the cleric's guiding bolt and guidance spells, and get a few free castings a day. And at level 6, you can use it to read the stars and tell the future. Depending on the roll, you can either add or subtract a d6 from someone's attack, save, or check a few times a day. And I know you're just using the chart, but I like to think of it as looking at your wild-shaped self and making your own thing. I gotta admit though, I'm impressed. I didn't expect something so cool out of the astrology domain. I'm kidding, of course, but you know how I feel about Watsi's take on space. But you can honestly do some really cool things with this. What culture doesn't have a vast network of belief and myths set around the stars? Constellations are as old as the eyes we view them with. Talk to your DM, change yours. As long as the mechanics stay the same, who cares if your chalice is a boat? Be a wispy diviner channeling the heavens. An engineer factoring in the stars for maximum light and stability during rituals. A witch who knows what herbs are best when picked under the current star sign. Or maybe you're a prince driven mad by thoughts from a cosmic god. First to map and form constellations that were drunkenly destroyed and times long forgotten. Or you could be like our local Durgar star druid, who's using the stars to chart a course and sail off the side of the map, trying to fall off the world with the right timing to land on the moon, where he can then mine it to nothing and fly to the ground, having rid all lycanthropes of their power. But we do not have time for that story. Finally, the Wildfire Druid. I bought the books only for this. A self-proclaimed brushfire druid back in Pathfinder 1e is what really cemented this as something I wanted to do all my life. And I gotta admit, I was surprised but pleased. A Wildfire Druid knows that fire is needed to wipe out old brush and make way for the new. Because of this, they get five spells that bring life and five Five spells that burn to ash. At level 10, that healing fire thing continues by making creatures who die within 30 feet erupt into spectral flame. They can make that fire hurt or heal those who touch it a few times a day. The other half of this circle's power is the wild fire companion. Instead of wild shaping, you can summon a fiery spirit for an hour. It can fly, it has a range attack and a bunch of condition immunities. It can teleport and take everyone beside it with it, leaving a burst of fire in its wake. You do need to use your bonus action to command it, but if you go down, it's free to do whatever it wants. At level 6, you can have your spells come from it instead of you, and as as long as it's here, your fire and healing spells get an extra D8. And at level 14, you don't need to worry about what the spirit does when you're down. If you go unconscious, you can rise from the spirit's ashes like a messed up phoenix. As long as it's within 120 feet, 
you can have it burn up to restore half your HP. It's only once a long rest, but I adore it. Take the Elemental Adept Feet to cut through fire resistance, and you will burn higher, burn brighter, fight fire with fire. I'm just glad this turned out so wonderfully. Thematic, powerful. It does have a weakness in fire immune things, but that's what the rest of your spell list is for. And besides, I like having a weakness. Reminds me why I'm bothering with a party. And as for flavor, this is your forestry department doing control burns to refresh the soil and stop trees from choking out the forest. Look, I want to give ideas for whoever isn't pumped full of them just from the concept, but I can't. Someone who changed my life, how I see myself and act, was basically this. My mind's eye can't see past the monolith of Fi. Fresh Fire Druid. He's the Pathfinder equivalent of a Moon Druid Fire Genasi, searching for his lost god of the circle of life and death, and in the meantime, making sure that will was done. Because Fi is willpower incarnate. Oh, the tales I could tell. Like sneaking away from the party to burn the forest, or trying to start a plague in a major city, but accidentally targeting one of the big bads exclusively. But this isn't the place for giant flaming dinosaurs screeching through walls and armies. This is the place where the circles come full circle. If there's one thing I hope I got across, it's that there's no bad druid. Although they tend to be complex, you really can't go wrong with any of these. Wonderful themes that let you explore nearly every concept you'd want to, with abilities as thematic as they are strong. The worst mechanically is probably Dream, and they're still a great healer. All of the druids are good, maybe not moon druid good, but few things are and we're better for it. If you're willing to put in the time and digging through options and possibilities excites you, the druid is amazing. But if you're you're looking at this and don't want something so complicated, that's fair. I'd recommend the Ranger or the Nature Domain for something with the same feel, or the Bard for versatility. I'd also recommend that you not panic. I'm going to be gone for an extra week or two to study up on Pathfinder and relax a bit. While you'd never guess from my upload speed, I actually spend most of my free time doing this. I need to study and I need a break, so I'm going to try to combine them into slower paced studying. If you want to leave a tip anyway, link to my copy in the description. Every dollar counts. And big thanks as always to this month's top supporters, Vero Goblin, Sergeant Daniels, and Modern Masquerade. Class dismissed. One look at your face brings down the human race To their knees, to their knees, begging please bear mercy Then there's somebody as charred and burned as me On their knees, on their knees, begging more gasoline